Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, or good e evening, if you're significantly to the west or to the east of Brussels. Uh, my name is Paul Adamson. I'm the chairman of Forum Europe. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the discussion on the governance of artificial intelligence, developing a global ecosystem of trust. Uh, before I introduce our very distinguished panel, let me briefly, briefly set the stage for the discussion in the next 75 minutes or so. We all know globally the pace of artificial intelligence development and deployment continues to increase. Simultaneously, around the world, policymakers are grappling with how AI should be regulated. Despite degrees of divergence in some areas, there is a growing consensus that trust matched with international policy coordination will be essential for AI to reach its full potential. This Forum Europe and Workday discussion will analyze the merits of greater global cooperation around the governance of AI. It will look at how policymakers might avoid a patchwork of international rules and debate the importance of working towards global approaches to trust and ethics. The session will look at how trusted AI ecosystems could facilitate trade and innovation and will also address issues around enforcement, liability, standards and data access. We have about 350 people registered for this event, a few more, I think. And so I look forward to a full discussion based on also your input from your questions. But don't worry if you'd just rather sit back for the next hour and quarter and listen to this very uh, informed discussion with my very distinguished panel, then you are perfectly free to, to do so. And if you're uh, one of those Twitter people, uh, bear in mind that our hashtag today is AI governance. Without further ado, let me introduce the, the panel. Jim Shaughnessy, Executive Vice President, Corporate Affairs at Workday. Kim Jurgensen, Head of Cabinet of Executive Vice President, Margaret Vestea, the European Commission. Anna Michelle Asimakopoulou, a member of the European Parliament and a member of the Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence in a Digital Age. Cecilia bonnefeld dahl Director General of Digital Europe, also a member of the High Level Expert Group on AI, the European Commission, put together. And last but not least, Andrea Renda, who's Senior Research Fellow and Head of Global Governance, Regulation, Innovation and the Digital Economy at the think tank, the Centre for European Policy Studies, and like Cecilia, a member of the High Level Expert Group. So let me start with you, Jim. Your organisation recently put together a very interesting and thoughtful, if I may say, uh, report on called Building Trust in AI and ML. So the next five, six, seven minutes or so, perhaps you could share with us some of the highlights of that report. Over to you, Jim. Great. Thank you, Paul, and thank you to the audience for joining us today. And a special thank you to the entire Forum Europe organization for uh, their support in holding today's event. We're gratified to participate in this important discussion of AI policy. As Paul said, I'm Jim Shaughnessy, Executive Vice President, Corporate Affairs at Workday. If you don't know us, Workday provides applications for financial management, human resources, planning, and analytics that have been adopted by thousands of organizations globally and across all industries. Workday was founded in 2005 based on the then audacious idea that HR and financial applications could be delivered through the cloud, thereby delivering customers benefits of modern technology and continuous innovation. To succeed with this new model, we needed to establish trust, trust in the cloud, trust in our new technology, trust in our security model, and trust in our ability to help customers protect the privacy of employees' personal information. Today, more than 60% of the Fortune 50 are Workday customers, and our services are deployed in more than 175 countries in over 30 languages. Approximately 50 million workers globally have their data in the Workday service. We're a proud participant in the European market where we have 21 offices across the continent and over 600 European headquartered customers. Today, we're standing at another cusp in the development of useful technology, representing even more opportunity than work they saw with the cloud 15 years ago. And that's the opportunity, opportunity to infuse enterprise applications with AI and ML technologies to fuel predictions and improve business decisions. We have the same task today that we had 15 years ago, to establish trust in technology that offers tremendous benefits to society, but also comes with actual and perceived risks. It's important to bridge that trust gap. We believe regulatory policy can play an important role in establishing and building trust. As Paul mentioned last week, Workday released a new waste white paper on this very question, building trust in AI and ML through principles, practice, and policy. More than a call for regulation, 
the white paper proposes establishing a trustworthy by design regulatory framework that we believe is well positioned to promote public trust and drive sustained AI and ML innovation. The trustworthy by design framework would apply to producers of AI tools. It contains requirements on transparency, including requiring the AI producers adopt a trustworthy AI policy, publish and adhere to AI principles, and provide transparency to their customers and end users. Governance, including requiring the AI producers adopt an internal governance framework, conduct impact assessments, and address potentially harmful bias. Accountability, including a mandate for producers to evaluate their AI systems across the full life cycle and enable responsible end use. It also contemplates an enforcement regime to ensure AI producers and deployers adhere to the framework's requirements. The framework is intended to be cross-sectoral and a jumping off point, scalable and flexible as standards and technology develops. We also recommend policy, makers, policy measures that governments should take to support AI and ML adoption and innovation. Specifically, we recommend policymakers support trusted AI innovation by encouraging harmonization across regulatory re regimes, supporting standards development, promoting access to data, and monitoring the applicability of, of existing liability rules to AI. It's our hope that the white paper offers a useful embarkation point for this discussion on AI policy both in terms of the importance of coordinating policy across borders, as well as more broadly developing regulation with trust and innovation in mind. We welcome the leadership the EU is taking in setting policy and regulation for AI and ML. We've participated actively and constructively in the European Commission's preparatory work, the high-level expert group on AI, and found our approach to be highly aligned with the HLEG's approach. We reviewed the Commission's white paper on AI with great interest and found ourselves largely in agreement with the Commission's risk-based approach. In our comments, we focused, one, on how an AI application is determined to be high risk, in particular, the notion that applications in some domains should be presumed to be high risk per se. Two, the importance of assessing whether existing liability regimes are adequate before new liability regimes are created. And three, the impracticability of prescriptive pre-market conformance assessments. We look forward to engaging on the soon to be proposed legislation and to a very lively discussion today. Uh, thank you very much, Paul, for the opportunity to uh, address this group. Thank you very much, Jim. That was um, very succinct, very concise, and a good uh, scene setter for the rest of the discussion. I have many questions for you, but I will hold back because I want to make sure everybody in the panel gets a chance to speak and our audience get a chance to, to, to pose their questions. Without further ado, over to you, Kim. Thanks a lot, Paul. Um, many thanks for inviting me uh, to this uh, this event. Also, thanks to Jim uh, for his uh, introduction. I'm happy to be here to give you uh, the EU uh, perspective uh, on dealing with artificial intelligence and how our uh, activities will fit into the global dis discussion around this uh, topic. As today's uh, agenda rightly suggests, suggest, and as, as you said, Paul, in, in your introduction, there is a growing uh, consensus among like-minded countries worldwide that artificial intelligence not only brings uh, huge benefits to our economies and societies, and, and it certainly will, uh, it also entails uh, risk that need to be carefully uh, managed. Uh, this uh, dilemma was already identified uh, in the Commission's white paper on AI uh, last February, uh, where we announced that we will be pursuing a two-pronged uh, uh, strategy. First, uh, to create an ecosystem uh, of excellence for Europe to become a global leader in this core technology, to align research uh, and investment uh, in AI across Europe, and to increase skills in this agenda, uh, in this area, sorry. We will increase investment into AI to a total of, of uh, 20 billion uh, euro per year, and secondly, uh, it's also important to create an ecosystem of trust to ensure that artificial intelligence does not unduly affect our fundamental rights, such as privacy or non-discrimination, or put our safety of life in, at risk. One of the discussions uh, points today is how we can ensure that regulation on AI does not endanger its innovation potential. This is, of course, uh, a very valid concern which is why we have always intended 
uh, to focus on any regulation on high-risk applications. But if we manage to do this properly, regulation and innovation, they are by no means two contradiction objectives. On the contrary, one can actually enable the other. If consumers and other users of AI uh, solutions don't trust, uh, don't have any trust in this uh, technology, this will slow down its uptake. And business will not fully engage in AI if they are faced with legal risk or uncertainties relating to their investment. In addition, where regulation on AI is being introduced, the problem of legal uncertainty may be replaced by the problem of legal fragmentation. We are already now seeing, I think uh, Paul also alluded to this effect, that there is actually a, a risk not only uh, of, of, of fragmentation within EU, um, we are also seeing this in other areas uh, on, on, um, on digital. We are seeing it in Digital Service Act and digital markets. There is a risk of fragmentation of the internal market, but we also today will have to have a discussion on the risk of facing a patchwork of international rules that might stifle innovation. I think this is a very important point. Well, at the European level, our response uh, to this and our recipe for economic prosperity has always been the single market. And this is why we try, we will try to achieve uh, with our proposal on high-risk AI systems in March. Um, later this year, we will also propose a European response to the need to clarify liability relating to AI. But a European response does not, does not necessarily lead to an international patchwork of rules. To start with, our own regulation will always already be in line with many of the principles that has already been discussed and agreed in various parts of the globe. The discussions in which we have, the Commission, the EU, member states, has participated ourselves, such as in the context of the OECD. If we manage to come up with a proportionate yet effective framework, we hope to influence also the international landscape, as we have successfully done with the GPDR. As everybody knows, this is as actually historically what the, what the Commission is, is preparing uh, in introducing legal uh, framework for the use of, of artificial intelligence. So therefore, of course, an international uh, harmonized rules or effort will not be something that will be made, made in one day or one week or one year. But for all this to happen, we need to closely liaise with like-minded countries around the globe, including uh, United States. Europe and the United States account for about a third of the world's trade and the standards we set each reach every corner of the world. Our shared values of human dignity, individual rights and democratic principles makes us natural partners to harness rapid technology change and to face the challenges of rival systems of dig dig digital governance. This gives us an unprecedented the window of opportunities to set a joint EU-US tech agenda. In December last year, the European Commission published a communication, a new US, US, EU-US agenda for global change. And one of the key actions points in this agenda is to work together on technology, trade and, and standard. Specifically on AI, the EU will propose to start work on a transatlantic AI agreement to set a blueprint for regional and global standard aligned with our values. And of course, to have a, a, a seminar today, uh, just after the inauguration of President Biden yesterday is of course very timely in that respect. And, and therefore, uh, uh, the today marks, today events marks a very excellent opportunity to discuss the global opportunities and challenges of this technology. I'll stop here, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Well within your time as well. It's a quick point of information, Kim. You mentioned this European response and liability on AI. Is that it? in addition to uh, the, your proposal coming out of the white paper last year, or is that a separate? No, it's because we will come up with, with sorry, we will come up with two set of, of, of legislation this year. We will come up with first a proposal either end of February or in March on, on AI follow up to the to the to the white paper from last year. But on the liability rule, that will be for the second part of this year. Okay. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Anna Michelle, uh, I'd like to hear from the European Parliament, please. Anna Michelle, over to you. Thank you, Paul. I'm delighted to be speaking amidst such distinguished company today. And I read your, your white paper with great interest and was pleased that it puts issues like trust and flexibility and cooperation at the heart of its proposals. And 
AI is definitely the flavor of the digital decade, so to speak. Rapid developments in AI and machine learning carry huge potential benefits. And the acceleration of the pace of digitization as a result of the pandemic is shaping what we're calling the new normal. But it also reveals to the public in a very short period of time that there's potential dangers for human rights and values that these technologies could entail. So the scope of AI considerations refers to immediate concerns about, for example, data privacy and, and bias, medium term concerns, for example, um, jobs and the workplace, and longer term concerns about the possibility of AI systems actually reaching or exceeding human equivalent capabilities. Therefore, I think it's necessary to explore the full ethical, social, and legal aspects of AI systems if we're to avoid these unintended negative consequences and with that risk from AI implementation. Um, these systems have to be introduced in ways that actually build trust and understanding and respect human and civil rights. And they need to follow fundamental human principles and values and safeguard the well being of people and the planet. Too many citizens today are wary of technological change, and our job is to reassure them that technology has constructive value in our society. I think it's clear that we all agree that trust is the key word. This is certainly the cornerstone of the AI strategy of the commission, which we just heard about. And it's a, um, not only a key word in the white paper, but in your, um, your uh, white paper as well. And it's certainly one of the prime concerns of the parliament and my political family, which is the European People's Party. Europe and, and its institutions are advocating a model that seeks balance, balance between providing flexibility so that there's room for innovation and scalability, safeguarding our competitiveness and our leadership, but at the same time, building trust and protecting our citizens' rights and our values in Europe. So this human-centric approach, which is principal and risk-based, places the well-being of people at the heart of its strategy. In our parliament, we deal with AI issues in a number of standing committees, but also in this committee that I'm privileged to be on, which is the Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence in the Digital Age, where we're working on a blueprint um, to achieve these goals and to adopt these principles in our approach collectively. Um, I uh, would like to say that um, there's clearly um, as you mentioned in your white paper, a broad international consensus around these key principles that need to guide trustworthy AI, that's fairness, transparency, accountability, respect for fundamental human rights. So if we want to ensure a responsible and a trustworthy development of AI supported by value-based principles, we need to act and agree collectively on these international standards. And I think that this will help us result, re respond to Chinese ag aggressive ambitions and to state surveillance capitalism models. Um, Like-minded nations at this point have to come together to set global standards for AI and international rules of conduct for AI that reflect democratic values. And at the same time, they have to address these critical ethical questions like facial recognition for surveillance, automated decision-making and algorithmic bias. Um, as, as was said previously, the results of the elections across the Atlantic have created positive expectations in Europe for a return to multilateralism in general, collective action, global, global leadership in defending democratic values, and a much needed fresh start for transatlantic cooperation. I think that Europe has already extended, let's say, a hand to the U.S., and I think that this may be the most opportune moment for Europe to put AI at the heart of this revival of the transatlantic relationship. This proposed transatlantic, let's say, rapprochement needs to get past these fractious disagreements about privacy rights and data flows and competition rules and taxation. The EU and the US have to come together and they need to reach workable and mutually beneficial compromises to promote AI rules and standards based on openness, interoperability, and competition. And I think it's become quite obvious as of late that in today's world, in what we're calling the new normal, there are no certainties anymore. And this includes democracy, which has been infected by populism in many countries from my own, which is the one that gave birth to it, to those that have traditionally championed it. So I think choosing to continue our joint path in the digital world guided by democracy is the most intelligent choice, artificial or otherwise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna-Michelle.
Uh, I have many questions as usual, but I will hold back uh, and pass the floor to, to Cecilia. Over to you, Cecilia. Thank you so much and thank you for the invitation. Uh, so first of all, I want to uh, praise the, the European Commission for taking an initiative of actually harmonizing the fragmentation of, of, uh, of EU on, in this area. I think we could be facing uh, a lot of different regulations in AI if we didn't coordinate it uh, on national level. And uh, this, uh, I totally agree with it. That would be even more disastrous for the, the ability of our companies to grow. I want to state maybe a few facts here. So. Um, Europe, as such, without the UK, only has around 5% of the world's unicorns. We have huge issues of scale-ups. We have a lot of innovation. We have really serious problems with scaling. So the harmonization and unfragmented um, regulatory environment in Europe is extremely important on data, on privacy, and on AI, of course. Um, and seeing now also an international collaboration will be absolutely key. One has to start, EU started, now we need to bring along uh, friends and maybe less friends on the journey towards doing the right things. Um, so maybe looking a little bit on uh, the process of, uh, of uh, how we have been working with AI, we started this uh, high-level group for artificial intelligence in the Commission, I think about two and a half, three years ago now, it was a long, uh, cumbersome process with a lot of different stakeholders and many different views. Uh, we came up with seven uh, major principles of what trustworthy AI is, um, looking at, of course, transparency, accountability, privacy, uh, and data governance, um, robustness and safety, uh, non-discrimination, diversity, human oversight, and societal and envi environmental uh, well-being. So the discussion was really, and the closer we got to these principles, we understood that they are all equally important, but also so that Europe is maybe one of the most well-equipped places in the world to actually adopt AI. Um, and that we should also be extremely careful not to put too much scare on AI and differentiate between high risk and low risk. Many of these areas are highly regulated and uh, very well regulated already. Let's look at, for example, liability rules. Okay, we will look at them all once again, but we have existing uh, laws on, on liability and we should use our existing framework as a base of looking at any kind of new regulation. If we look at privacy, Europe, uh, EU has also walked in front on GDPR. And actually, we have quite well defined also risk uh, definitions within the GDPR that we can use directly on the artificial intelligence area. If we look at uh, transparency, robustness, we have uh, a lot of standards, a lot of um, sector-based regulation uh, on health, on transportation, on these high-risk areas already. And it's uh, really important that um, the companies that are today are applying all these and spending a lot of money and efforts actually um, complying with these laws and regulations that we built upon um, the existing frameworks and involve them. And why am I saying this? I mean, it's a fact and we can, we always say that there is no contradiction between um, highly regulatory markets and, and innovation. But we can learn one thing, that it is very difficult to be a scale-up in Europe. And uh, if we want those scale-ups within these uh, tech areas also, not only, but also to be in Europe, we also need to be extremely careful not to over-regulate even further as we lack the scale scalability already. However, we shouldn't shy away from looking at high risk. And then what exactly is high risk? Here, we should really differentiate between low risk and high risk, where high risk areas uh, would need, for example, human oversight. We would uh, look at concrete risks of, for example, transparency that has need of transparency and accountability. Um, but it is also very important to identify those. And through the grapevines, and I can ask Kim in a second if this is right, I hear that the Commission is, is working with use cases on specific areas. And I think this is a really, really fantastic way of doing it because um, sometimes we have experience, I'm not saying on what, but uh, that regulation has been done without really a high involvement of the one who are living these use cases. And only if we identify 
concrete uh, use cases can we understand the risk that it poses and judge what to do with that risk so i think that's a very sensible way of doing it and um, and it allows also to um, to involve um, a vast majority of stakeholders in what they experience as real life and maybe that is really the process of how to not hamper innovation but still safeguarding uh, the high risk areas thank you okay. Very much, Cecilia. Thank you. Uh, I now turn to Andrea. Over to you, Andrea. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me. Um, uh, thanks to Forum Europe, uh, and uh, congratulations also to to Jim and and Steam for producing uh, a, a nice report. Um, I think we can we we have made some steps forward. Let's say uh, we could. There's some difference compared to let's say a couple of years ago when we started. Or well, three years ago, maybe as Cecilia was saying, when we started uh, really uh, paving the way for uh, uh, developing a policy framework on AI, um, even the world and the landscape of AI looks different uh, today compared to uh, two or three years ago. And I would say, as a starting point, that there is more global alignment today on the fact that AI uh, um, can and should be regulated in one way or another, meaning that regulation will not necessarily stand in the way of uh, uh, meaningful innovation if it's properly timed, adequately stringent, and uh, well-drafted. And um, we also uh, have seen developments of uh, uh, AI that uh, fall in the realm of, if you wish, private governance of technology, which uh, call for some questions even uh, that relates to the stability of our democracies, uh, to a number of risks for fundamental rights that are increasingly emerging. So there is a need to regulate artificial intelligence and its development in a way that is proportionate, obviously, in a way that is risk-based, in a way that in some cases can also be precautionary whenever we do not know exactly the entity, the magnitude, and the, uh, and the, and the direction of the risks uh, that uh, AI deployment is generating. So, um, uh, what should be the objective of that regulation? Second message that I want to launch, yes, trust is important, but you can trust very bad things. So, trustworthiness is indeed very different from uh, an expression of, let's say, mere trust into something. Trustworthiness incorporates, as Cecilia was also recalling, an element of directionality, meaning that uh, the AI systems that we place our trust uh, on are worthy of our trust, also because they are oriented towards uh, um, the, the, the common good. And uh, in this respect, in my opinion, uh, the key objective of the forthcoming AI regulation in Europe, and also, if possible, of the global efforts in regulating AI, should be uh, to treat AI as a means to an end, uh, where the end is a future prosperous, sustainable society that is inclusive. And this is uh, very important because the European Union has an overall strategy that is not about AI, but it's about uh, uh, sustainability and resilience uh, in the medium to long term. AI has to be and can be a key component in there, but not any type of AI. It should be the, that type of AI that should be encouraged, that is really functional uh, to the um, to the overarching goals of the European Union. That said, governing AI is one of the most difficult things on earth. Pre uh, uh, presenting a uh, proposed regulatory intervention, like Kim mentioned, in a few weeks from now, is extremely brave and courageous on the side of the European Commission. There will be problems in terms of the definition of AI, which in my opinion should be entirely technology neutral and not uh, focused on machine learning only for reasons that obviously you can elaborate upon. There are uh, key problems in risk classification. Um, I have serious doubts that a binary approach between high risk, low risk is going to do justice to the um, uh, complexity uh, and the pervasiveness of AI developments and on the proportionality of the regulatory interventions that would follow from, uh, uh, from it. And uh, uh, there will also be problems in the remedies and, and the enforcement, um, simply betting on Conformity assessment before products reach the market is going to be insufficient because most of the risks generated by the AI are only visible and uh, only emerging when AI hits the market, when AI hits and interacts with other AI products or with individuals over time, or in particular for those AI systems that learn from the external environment. So it's going to be a problem also in terms of overall governance because uh, the uh, topic and the matter is so uh, constantly evolving 
that uh, as standardization body is unlikely to capture all the uh, you know fast breathtaking evolution uh, of AI uh, and uh, a, a traditional agency or ministry is unlikely or even courts and judges are unlikely to be able to provide the the, uh, the regulatory and legal certainty that is needed in these fields. So one has to work also on what type of flexible, agile uh, governance mechanisms have to be put in place. So this is for the internal part. Now, if the Europe manages and someone, as Cecilia was saying, has to take the first move, it would be extremely important because the European Commission will propose the first ever all-encompassing comprehensive regulatory intervention on AI. There will be mistakes, there will be gaps, but someone has to go first. And I think, uh, as Cecilia was saying, and Kim as well, I think uh, implicitly, uh, the, the EU, I think, is best positioned for that. Now, how to reach a global alignment on these values? In my opinion, there will be um, a very you know, important obstacles on the way, not only because the EU has uh, uh, adopted a more, uh, say, a hybrid uh, strategy with respect to global governance, which entails strategic autonomy or open strategic autonomy and potentially technological sovereignty, uh, but also because our approach to risk and many of our interpretation of ethical principles and legal principles are different from those of others. In my opinion, Europe also has a need to concentrate much more on ex ante controls or ongoing governance compared to legal systems that have a stronger litigation apparatus, such as the, as the US. So what could happen? I think we could eventually land on agreements on areas such as risk assessment, potentially risk classification, perhaps mutual recognition of algorithmic auditing and inspections, and uh, to some extent, but only uh, with a limited scope on standards at the global level. Uh, but I would, and this would be actually success in my opinion, what could happen on top of this, hopefully, is cooperation on deploying AI for good. So now that the US is back in the Paris Agreement, we could probably sit down and start thinking about not any type of AI, but those AI and Internet of Things applications and uh, complementary technologies that can help us achieve uh, uh, the greater good in things like sustainable development, healthcare, obviously, but also in the overall protection of fundamental rights around the world. So I'll stop there, happy to elaborate on each of those concepts. Thank, thank you, thank you very much, Andrea. Well, we've had uh, now the opening remarks of all our panel. I just remind the audience now is a good time if you want to to start putting your questions in the in the chat function. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to carry on the conversation. What strikes me listening to all of you is that obviously there's quite a broad consensus of what the issues are at stake. Um, what is very refreshing also is that um, whilst people recognise the potential of AI, there all there's no from my perspective, no evidence of particular hype, which often you get in these discussions, over-promising, uh, over-describing maybe what the benefits of AI are. It's all pretty lucid. Uh, but at the same time, the, con the concerns are there. So I'm going to ask a rather broad question to all of you, and then you can choose which part of the broadness you want to want to address. I'll, I'll start again with you, Jim. I'm going to quote back to you, your part, a section in your report. Uh, you say, uh, and I'm quoting, although companies, policymakers, and public and private sector organizations are working to build trust, current efforts are likely to leave gaps in coverage, gaps that could on the one hand give rise to irresponsible or unintended uses of AI, and on the other result in underutilization of safe and productive AI solutions. Why did you make that statement? Unmute, could you run? Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. That was actually one of the topics that, that we discussed internally uh, uh, quite a bit. And, and um, part of it is fueled on observation of what the you know, future pervasiveness of, of AI and the growing pervasiveness of AI and that, that um, this is a little bit hyperbolic, but almost any place where there is now code in the future, there will be at least some bit of of ai which is using you know predictive algorithms based on on data um, uh, to help inform human decision making and that that uh, without a a comprehensive uh, framework some some developers will spend uh, more time attending to ethical issues than others so the public will focus on ethical issues in some places more than others uh, some people will be deterred from innovating some some won't uh, some applications will be trusted some will will not and and the, in our view the way to to optimize this is to have a um, have a framework where everyone who is developing uh, 
AI or developing AI features or incorporating AI features in, in products and technology would have the responsibility to uh, to uh, employ the the trustworthy AI framework and to uh, provide the level of transparency, governance, and, and accountability that that, uh, that will engender uh, public trust, um, uh, and that will result in uh, it will avoid this you know suboptimal outcome where where uh, you know, there are some risky AI uh, applications get implemented with with to bad effect, and where people forego doing things that would be beneficial because of uh, of uh, potentially uh, ir irrational uh, fears, you know, fuel, fueled by um, you know, the lack of trust. So it's a, it's getting this balance right. I think is it's what's really key, and and is more than anything else is what what fueled our our view that the. Uh, the, the appropriateness of the trustworthy AI framework. Okay, thank you. T turn to you, Kim. I mean, the, the broad theme of this event is is is, is the global aspect, uh, finding a global ecosystem of trust. But obviously, that we need to build uh, building blocks to get there. And one of the things I noticed in your intervention, Kim, was you were talking very candidly about fragmentation, but inside the European Union, and we all know about uh, moves by quite important member states like France and Germany to, to, to do their own thing. So you did say in your, in your opening remarks that there's this concern about, about fragmentation, which I want to press you on. I mean, how concerned is the commission about that? And how is that kind of informing how you're taking this, this whole issue forward? Um, but linked to that, you were talking also about, and it's almost like the commission has got high on this, the success of the GDPR, this idea that you want the Brussels effect. You want to, in a sense, uh, not so much have first mover advantage, but uh, set the scene and other, other panelists refer to that as well. So could you try and bring all those elements together? You, you're concerned about fragmentation inside the, the single market, but on the same time, you, the EU wants to position itself as a, uh, at least an inspirer of world rules, which is Andrea was talking about well just now. Hope that was no, clear. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's two time. Yes, uh, in the sense that, that that there is this risk of fragmentation. It, it's it's most probably bigger uh, when when it, when we look to the Digital Service Act uh, than, than than here, where where this is actually, as, as Andrea said, this is a, a first time, a first mover. But where, I mean, the Commission, I think the member states, uh, we all really want. Uh, we know it's risky. We know there would be obstacles, as we said. But 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 it's needed. Uh, and and uh, and uh, the Commission hopes that we will be some kind of a standard setter like like the like we saw on the GPDR, and we actually already I think even before the COVID hit us, we had uh, a lot of uh, meetings with even the, also the the previous uh, U.S. administration. We have it with with, with Japan uh, with a lot of different countries who are looking to EU to actually be the first one to go out there because there is a general global need uh, for doing uh, something and 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 I I think it's also important to 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 stress that, that there is already a lot out there uh, Cecilia mentioned it in the GPDR and and standards and we certainly don't want to over regulate we don't want to kill all the star startups because as, as Cecilia said we do have a scale up uh, problem and we have a huge problem in keeping startups whenever they're growing. So so that is certainly not something we want to kill. That's also why we are taking this high risk approach where there is, there's a few areas that is for outright banned from the beginning. And then as, as Cecilia said, we, we are choosing now this approach of use case specific in specific uh, areas and not in, in whole sectors as was the original idea. This is what came out of the public consultation. So here, I think we, are, we tried hard to listen to, to the result of the public consultations. But getting back to the other one, risk of fragmentation Yes, uh, but but we are certainly also trying to be a standard setter here. Right. Um, turning to Anna Michelle, uh, you made a point which I'll come back to maybe a bit later in the, I'll bring in Cecilia and Andrea about this balance, as you said, between innovation uh, and trust and protecting citizens' rights. Um, but he also talked a lot about the, the human centric uh, uh, part of AI and so how that's almost like a, a European way of doing things, if you like. But you did say there's an urgent need for a pressing need for like minded countries and regions to to set global standards on openness, interoperability and competition. How 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 easy is it to think to get that um, approach, that joint collective approach off the ground? Are there already encouraged from your perspective, encouraging signs that's taking place or that need a, a new effort to create that new uh, collective action? 
Well, I, I would hope that this, you know, reboot of the transatlantic relationship and um, President Biden's uh, thoughts of having this conference on democracy may be uh, a good forum to to have these discussions. But I mean, I, I would hate, you know, as a politician, I would hate to see this turning into a, a, a discussion on where the forum should be and who should have control over it and what the procedurals. There's plenty of international fora. I mean, I'm also a member of STOA and um, the Scientific and Technological Options Assessment uh, Committee in the in the parliament. And, and we have looked at the OECD work, for example, being done on AI standards. That's a perfectly acceptable global forum to have this discussion. And there's there's lots of other for uh, I think mostly we need to have, let's say at this point, uh, in order to, and I'm looking at this again from the point of view of the citizens that I represent and my heightened concern for democracy and citizens' rights in that context. Uh, I think we need some high level political symbolism at the moment to get us back into, uh, to give us more impetus on this. I completely agree that there, you know, we have potential in AI to again, see this so-called Brussels effect, which is uh, what we heard of before, just like in the GDPR, because we're such a big market, we can impose some of our standards. But um, I, I would hope that we'd see some, you know, just like VDL put digital transformation at the center of our policy, I would hope that from the Biden administration, for example, there would be some political symbolism and a, and a gesture in that direction that shows that we're we're about to move down this path um, in light of the fact that we have, you know, other types of regimes that are using this in a different way and to, to show that internationally, we will be the leaders on this. So um, I think there's plenty of ways to do it. That's not the problem. Finding a way is not, it's not the way, it's the will at the moment that I think we need to strengthen and show people around the world that it exists. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Michelle. And, and Cecilia, you made the point uh, about this balance to be struck, which you, one hears a lot, as you know, in Brussels, that between regulation uh, on the one hand, which I think broad consensus, some kind, as Andrea said, some kind of regulation is needed on the one hand, but also balance that with not the need not to stifle innovation. I mean, do you, I mean, is that, I'm sure that was just a reflexive comment you made. You have grounds for concern that the, that the policymakers may come out with some kind of uh, um, unhelpful regulation to stifle the, the innovation you say, and, um, and grow these, these unicorns in Europe you say that we need to have more of. I mean, no, absolutely not. I mean, uh, but I'm always a positive person, so I also try, I always look at the best side of, of things. Uh, and I think if the vision is the right one, well, then the rest is hard work and uh, working with your stakeholders and, and execution. And I think we have tried to do that for three years now. On the international part, I don't know about the concrete fora, but but there are several. I mean, you, you have, of course, the WTO, you have uh, maybe even NATO on security things, uh, you have human rights, uh, you know, uh, organizations. So we will have to find how to do this in trade agreements. I don't know. Uh, anyway, I would say, um, no, I don't have a, uh, but I, what I do note is that we speak a lot about the risk. <laughs> We speak a lot about what can go wrong, right? And every time there is an innovation, there is a risk, but there is also great progress, right? And and we just have to remember each time we do something, we need to do that with open eyes on what where are we going, right? And of course, how do we prevent risk? But is this a real risk or are we so careful that we are over careful? And, um, and as I said, if we look at, for example, the fundamental rights, I mean, discrimination is illegal in, in Europe. We cannot do that, right? We have a very good framework and, and, and we just need to, to state that. I mean, we have to implement it, even though it's been valid for decades. Um, we still face discrimination also in Europe and uh, it's about enforcing it and, 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 um, and knowing and, and I would say guidelines, even for some on consumer law, I mean, or on discrimination, being very clear on use cases. What is it that we don't accept? What is what are the principles that we follow, and what is it that we don't accept? Uh, even within the uh, the existing regulation, could do just as much benefit as necessarily finding new regulation in a range of areas. That said, of course, 
I think pr public sector, for example, has a special responsibility. I mean, we all know uh, when go good, government, uh, go good governments are in power, then the risk is low. Once not so good governments are in power, the risk are very, very, very high. History in Europe shows this again and again. So, for example, an agreement amongst uh, the member states of EU on how to do procurement or how to make sure that do they do a uh, trustworthy AI um, procurement would be a huge first step, right? And implementing high standards in public sector and agreeing on these seven principles that came forward from the from the high level group would be a major step. That, that the government signed up to actually um, applying these trustworthy uh, tr principles of trustworthy AI. Okay, thank you. And and then to you, Andre. Then I'll bring in the questions from the audience. So uh, you said, uh, Andre, that regulation is a means to an end, and but it does raise the issue of overall governance, and which is the broad theme of today's discussion. And you said that. Uh, as far as you could, you're concerned, the traditional standardization bodies and traditional agencies, ministries, even the courts are not up, are not really appropriate for this. Uh, so you need some, you need flexible, I'm quoting your words back at you, my friend, flexible and agile system to be put in place. What, what would you suggest are these flexible and agile? Give us a clue. Let's go from the theory down to some of the, the practical. Yeah, no, first of all, uh, the reason why I think some of the traditional mechanisms are not uh, fit for purpose is essentially speed, uh, but also the uh, dynamic nature of AI systems after they have reached the market, as I was saying before. So um, a standardization body obviously can develop uh, product standards, but also organizational and process standards. And this is what is happening a little bit in the work of um, IEEE or ISO, uh, meaning there is a tendency initially to focus on how a single product could be potentially oriented towards uh, trustworthiness or ethical alignment. But then indeed what emerges as the most important aspect is whether the organization that brings it to the market has the governance arrangements in place to be reactive and responsive whenever the product starts, the, the algorithm starts going off track. And this we've seen in countless ways, you know, since the early experiments of Microsoft with the chatbot Ty, who managed in just a few minutes to become fascist and racist uh, on Twitter, just because it was uh, learning from all the, the garbage that you find in the comments sections on Twitter, right? And we know that we can do good things as humans, but sometimes we give the worst of ourselves when we, when we, when we build, join a collective of that sort. So um, the, the dynamic nature, the need to control the products that are on the market uh, provides new, new challenges. And in, uh, in my opinion, uh, we need a new concept that is not necessarily the traditional agency, but is a, uh, an expert-led uh, body that is able to continuously update uh, the knowledge on what are the practices that are uh, considered to be potentially trustworthy and what governance arrangements should accompany them as opposed to uh, the ones that are not, uh, that are not qualifying uh, to be trustworthy. So rather than having a board GDPR style, if you wish, uh, having a, a perhaps a version of the high level group with, with a much stronger mandate that continues to update the knowledge in the field uh, and uh, you know uh, really provides um, uh, cert uh, more certainty, not absolute certainty, but more certainty to the ones that ask themselves on a daily basis, should I deploy AI or not, is something that I would see as a, as a good advantage. If this could happen at the European level, it would be already uh, great. Obviously, at the global level, would be more difficult also because what we call ethical and trustworthy is still not the same thing. So agile governance uh, can be obviously discussed in many different ways. I know that be between, just to provoke a little bit my, my co-panelists, between the Commission and the Parliament, there have been a little bit already of disagreement as regards the governance mechanisms. Maybe I am uh, offering a third way, <laughs> I don't know. And uh, uh, there's n no reference to the fact that uh, Cecilia and I have been part of a previous high-level group. I would actually structure it in a completely different way. But, uh, um, but still, I think it is something that is needed today in order to provide uh, uh, really the, the dynamic, um, um, uh, say, endorsement of uh, good solutions that the market needs to to really scale up the good solutions and uh, discard the ones that are less trustworthy. Okay, thank you, Andrea. Well, that's a cue to bring in the question now, some of the questions from the audience. Uh, you, you haven't all got to answer, by the way, in the panel. You can you can just uh, let other people do the heavy lifting. A question from a gentleman called Didier Cornel. He doesn't give his affiliation. Hello, Didier. Um, 
His question is, what would be the number one legal rule that you would propose if there was an international body deciding on rules and principles for a accountable and socially useful AI? Who would like to take a stab at answering that question? The one legal rule that you would propose? I think there will be transparency and opening up of the black box because what what was Cecilia said, I mean you cannot enforce any other rules if if, if there's no sort of uh, transparency and opening up of, of the of the black box. Okay, thank you, thank you, Clem. And Andrea, you got your hand up. For me, the number one rule, the golden rule, is machines are never responsible. Humans are. Okay, thank you. Well, that's your question addressed to you, uh, Andrea, from Michael Boni, a distinguished former member of the European Parliament, a member of uh, Anna Michel's group, now a senior associate researcher at the Martin Center. Uh, he said to you, Andrea, thank you for your speech, uh, and mentioning ex ante, uh, indicating also the problems of governance. But he asked, what beyond regulation, what kind of institutional framework is needed? I mean, it, the high level group maybe is not quite enough, surely. Do we need some more institutional structure? Yeah, what I was referring to before goes in that direction. Uh, I think uh, um, there is a need for uh, constant reflection and sharing experiences between experts. It could be a multi-stakeholder group that acts as an agile governance mechanism. Uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily an authority, let's say, or an agency. Uh, that said, I think there's a lot of, uh, of soft law and, and uh, and development of uh, even competing standards under the framework of trustworthy AI that will be needed. So um, to me, I, if I were uh, in the decision making mode there, I would put myself in sort of a monitoring uh, mode to see whether uh, this relatively soft way of uh, um, uh, steering the, the developments in the market uh, uh, is sufficient before going into a more structured and sometimes more rigid forms of governance. This is, I think, what okay. is needed. I will also uh, second what uh, Cecilia was saying before uh, about the role of the public sector, uh, because um, um, obviously, as Kim would probably probably thought when this was evoked, public procurement it doesn't fall uh, under the competences uh, of the EU. It's uh, still very fragmented. Uh, but that said, uh, if there could be an agreement between member states that trustworthy AI is procured and, and government, this would mean that at least 15% of European GDP, you know, the public procurement machine would come to the rescue uh, when it comes to securing that AI is trustworthy. It would be a big, big difference. Okay, Cecilia. Yes, yeah, so I, I tend to, to uh, it, it seems that we all agree, right? But okay, I tend to agree with Andrea, of course, with, with, um, with the add-on that there might be areas uh, that need to be th strengthened, so, so the high-risk area that will be defined hopefully through these use cases, uh, where you know regulatory revision or add-ons needs to to be done. So so um, maybe with that add-on, and I just want to say there are very very few um, companies that survive very long, or even leaders in private sector that wakes up and think like, hmm, I want to do something that's not trustworthy and harming somebody. And you know, there is a market mechanism that it will actually punish that very quickly. <laughs> and, uh, and I think this is this is something that we need to to remember, we all want trustworthiness, we want our clients and our citizens to um to un understand as much as possible but also trust us long term and uh, and as i said we do have a quite credible amount of regulation in europe um and uh, and we need to be cautious uh, to define those high risk areas and take maybe if that is really the the, the way of of europe to go forward on tech is that more agile way of doing it and I see the current commission actually doing that, involving private sector much more, involving um, civil society much more. And, and I think that's a positive move. And, and I think we also have to to let that kind of um, agile uh, policy making actually find its its way into a more maybe formula, uh, formalized way. Thank you, Cecilia. A question now about transatlantic. I mean, I know it's not really the main theme, but since uh, Anna Michelle mentioned it, particularly in her intervention, Kim touched on it, and Jim is speaking to us from the East Coast of the United States, I, let me just ask the question. Hopefully, people will, will jump in to answer. The, the question is as follows from Jos van Yersel, Industrial Transformation Consultancy. 
the question. Most speakers underline transatlantic cooperation. Is the EU at the moment sufficiently equipped for that cooperation given European fragmentation? And where do you see smooth agreement with the US? And where do you perceive possible impediments from both sides? Anna and Michelle, would you like to take a stab at that? Um, sure. Well, you know, the EU fragmentation and what it can do as a whole and what, what member states do is a big discussion. But, um, you know, it, it would make sense to start from the money. So it makes sense to start with the taxation issues. I think that would pave the way for, a, you know, a lot of other things to move forward. But I think that's clearly um, more difficult to achieve because because each member state might have its own, um, you know, have its own thoughts on that. But um, I, I think possibly then um, probably privacy would be the first the first place we could start in the in the sense that we actually do have GDPR, which is, you know, I think outgrown its its uh, its infancy stage and is is becoming a little bit more um, mature. <laughs> yeah, let's say you know it's it's gone through a lot of the stuff that it that it should have gone through. Although I think it does it probably in light of AI, it's going to need some tweaking. But um, I think that that would be a sensible place to start. That's already an issue in in the United States. Um, I think that we could try and come together there. Another, another um, let's say, discussion that could spearhead uh, bringing us closer together on many issues uh, would be what just came up with, you know, with, uh, with turning off Twitter <laughs> for a president and when you can actually do that. I mean, I think that that's, that's a discussion that citizens would get involved in too, and that could in and of itself create some, some momentum. But, um, I, you know, I said I'm all for it, but um, I didn't say it's easy. <laughs> no, so, no. Uh, okay. yeah. Right. Do you, you want to come in, Kim? I think, do you raise your hand? Yeah. And then, Actually, I'm somewhat more optimistic uh, on, on, on this one. Uh, it said, it's, it's correct that I said that, that there's a risk of fragmentation and we're seeing it already among member states. But there is a reason why uh, the digital transformation is, is, is one of the two main priorities for this, this commission and, and why the commission has already now tabled legislation on the DSA and the DMA in, in December and why we're now coming forward with, with legislation on, on AI in, in, in March. Uh, this is simply because we we are, we are going to, to roll out a, a whole set of legislation within the digital uh, sector and where basically the whole world is looking at us. It's not only the US and it's not only other democracies, it's also China, it's Africa, it's all, whenever there is a, a meeting with third countries, digital and tech is going to be only uh, growing, I mean, getting more and more up on the top of the agenda. And it, it might be that, that, that they will not copy one to one our legislation that's for sure because as we talked about earlier on on ai this is a first mover it's historical on the on the dsa it, we are renewing it it's something that is 20 year old uh, so and and of course we have a tradition at eu level to to legislate more ex ante as andrea andrea said the us has a different approach but they are approaching us we are getting closer to each other and so, so I, I'm, I'm quite. I mean, I'm much more optimistic. I mean, it's going to take years, but, but still, I'm much more optimistic actually. Right. And Jim from the U.S. side. I, I, uh, humble enough that I hope I don't speak on behalf of all of the United States. But <laughs> we're here in the first full day of the Biden administration, and they have a, a very, very full agenda. Um, Improving the transatlantic relationship is a is an extremely important part of that. But even that, it's only one item, and that's it's multidimensional. Um, uh, so I I think that the signs of of engagement are, are very positive and very strong, and and that's that's great. Uh, I think privacy will be be an element. Um, security will be another element. Uh, Taxation is probably higher on Europe's agenda than it is on the U.S. agenda, um, but right now. But um, but I, I could be could be wrong on that. But um, I think that it, it is important, as Kim said, to, to be patient and to look for progress in areas where we where there is alignment, uh, and not worry as much about areas where there is not alignment. Um, the mention of, of the action of the social media platforms in in um, 
cutting off uh, the president's access is very interesting. And there's one anecdotal data point. I, I saw a survey this past week of a non-scientific survey uh, uh, of U.S. CEOs that said somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of U.S. CEOs agreed with the Twitter and Facebook decision. Well, the response from from Europe is, is very different than that. And, and, and I think if you'd ask the question differently about the power and influence of platforms on our uh, politics, you, you might have gotten different different answers. So it's um, it'll be a uh, it'll be an interesting uh, four years, in particular this, this this first year. Okay, I'll, I'll move on to the next question, if I may. Uh, and do a quick, do you want a quick uh, comment, Andrea? Yeah, I'll try to be super yeah. quick. Uh, to yeah. me, um, the we we are seeing two unprecedented things in this field. One is there is complementarity between the EU and the US, meaning I'm very quick on that, but the EU is stronger in some aspects of the digital economy, take 5G, than the US. Uh, and the US obviously is more developed on the platform side, okay? And I think there is a lot of complementarity that didn't exist before. Second, um, I think that the model of exante controls that the EU has uh, more with exante controls compared to the exposed to litigation-based control that the US has had for a long time in the digital economy in particular, but more generally, uh, I mean, the, the EU model is proven to be superior at the moment. Um, and uh, this is why everybody's looking at us and not at the US. And uh, finally, I, I think that uh, from the antitrust side and the taxation side, there can be an agreement where I see more problems is on uh, the, the data strategy side, obviously, because there uh, Europe has the ambition to repatriate and redistribute if you wish, the data production and storage and elaboration in a way that the U.S. cannot fully, uh, of course, uh, uh, approve uh, and and endorse. So that is my quick uh, uh, right. transatlantic uh, relations uh, uh, diagnosis. Okay, we'll do another session just on that, I promise you, in the future. A question which strikes me as rather provocative, but maybe I'm missing it, uh, missing the point, from gentleman Tadas Tumenas, advisor of the Standards Body Orgolim. As follows his question, most of the speakers are talking about AI in the B2C context. However, we need to take into account that there is no integral AI that can be tackled by legislation uniformly. What would be the panel's views on industrial AI, B2B? In most of the cases, AI in, B in the B2B context is low risk AI and doesn't meet any additional regulation. Cecilia. No, uh, thank you for, uh, for that question. And, and exactly that takes us back to the use case scenario. I mean, first of all, if you look at industrial uh, AI, a lot of it is uh, already regulated, for example, the safety regulation uh, and ISO standards, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of existing regulation and standards in those areas. And certainly true. I mean, the, the business to business is very different from business to consumer. And this is exactly why we need to take a concrete um, uh, high, so high, low risk or risk based approach. Uh, based on concrete use cases to understand exactly what applies within which segments and not just regulate um, across the across the across the board and I think this is the approach taken which is very positive um, and I mean European Europe in particular is quite strong in the industrial sectors at the moment and can actually I mean, we are leading a manufacturing sector period right so so it is very important that we actually, um, apply what we have and review it with the eye of uh, being already in lead, both in regulation, but also in, um, in, in, in that sector. Thank you. Anybody else want to come in on this one? Uh, Kim, my friend. Way to unmute. Somebody, either you unmute or somebody will unmute you. Sorry, I, I mean, I agree complete, completely with, with, with Cecilia on this one. I mean, the approach we're taking is, is like this pyramid where at the, at the very top of the pyramid there are things that, that basically are prohibited and then uh, next to that there will be a, a slightly other part of the of the pyramid that is this high risk approach where we will say as i said before we will take use cases instead of whole sectors and then the, the main bulk of the pyramid there will there will be i mean there, there, we have a lot of regulation already as cecilia said but we don't want to introduce new regulation i mean there will be a lot of business uh, to business uh, AI, where, where we don't see a need for, for further uh, regulation that, that, that we already have today. Okay. Anybody else want to come in before I move to the next question? Fine. 
A question from Ewan Grant, Grant and Gutzler Consultants. Uh, his question is as follows. Regarding fragmentation risk mentioned both within the EU and between it and quote unquote like-minded countries, what work is being done regarding protection of AI technologies against theft or damage by state and non-state parties? Who wants, that's a good bit of geopolitics in the AI debate. Kim, you're back to you, yeah. You're I'm sorry. <laughs> But, but, but that's basically one of the requirements also for, for, for high-risk AI for providers, where, where we would also set requirements for robustness and accuracy and security. And there is a lot of work already being done also on cybersecurity and, and in other en environments where, where this is, um, where that will, will check in, I would say. Okay. Anybody else want to come in on that one? You know. Maybe uh, very quickly. I don't see... Yeah. A big difference between uh, the, the overall debate on uh, theft or you know cyber, the cybersecurity aspects of theft of intellectual property and uh, and trade secrets uh, um, uh, from state and non-state actors uh, and in, you know in general and in the case of AI. So I think perhaps more work should be done, but I don't see a specific case for AI here. I mean, it's more. AI is increasingly used for theft of, theft of intellectual property <laughs> around the world, and perhaps one needs to deploy AI uh, defense solution, defensive solutions in that respect. Uh, um, but yeah, the, the problem is bigger than AI, in, in my opinion. Okay. If nobody else wants to come in, a question from Rowena Rodriguez from Tr Trilateral Research. Her question, what about protecting the interests of vulnerable populations and thinking more deeply about this? There are hidden impacts, particularly where such populations have no choice when AI systems are piloted and deployed in their environments. It's interesting. We haven't, we kind of neglected that part of the discussion until now. Anybody want to come in and respond to Rowena? Uh, Anna Michelle. Anna Michelle, Michel, yeah, yeah. Michel, then, then you, Andrew. I, don't well, I think I, I think that it's that it's obvious that these would be you know this would be a case that's at the top of our concern pyramid. Um, you know when when you're talking about trustworthy AI and when you're talking about human oversight and when you're talking about algorithmic bias, clearly all this you know would ha would hurt vulnerable populations more than anybody else. So um, yeah, I, I think that that's a concern that's built into the approach, which is based on trust, which is based on risk. So. Um, I think that's there. Certainly, it's in the Parliament's awareness. There's no question about that. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? If not, oh, Andrea, sorry. Yeah, no, just I see two different problems here, very related, obviously, but slightly different. They at least could be could be described separately. Uh, one is the tendency of, uh, especially machine learning, to uh, uh, eliminates, uh, let's say, cons adequate consideration of minorities and vulnerable groups. And this is something that, especially in the US, is already heavily felt because of the perhaps more pervasive use of algorithms. Okay. The second is more in terms of uh, relationship with developing countries, if you wish. Uh, um, sometimes I, I call this problem the junk AI problem, meaning that uh, the quest for cost cutting and, uh, and solving complex problems such as, for example, huge backlogs in courts and so on, might lead some countries or some international donors to deploy AI solutions in countries, maybe solutions that have been trained with non-local data, solutions that do not do justice to the to the peculiarities of the, of the local environment. They are not tailored to that local environment. They create maybe enormous false positives and negatives, uh, but still they are preferable because they cut costs. And I think that is something that could happen, meaning it could happen around the world eventually. Human plus machine is the luxury solution. Machine is the dirt track solution that some of the less privileged will get. Okay, right. I think that might be the final question of the audience and I'll try and uh, ask you all a question to round up because we're running out of time, unfortunately. From Aista Ramanos, I probably mispronounced that, Aista, forgive me, Committee Secretary, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. The question, how to tackle unintended harm and consequences from AI use? That's a kind of, we've been touching on that thing since for about an hour without maybe delving deeply in, enough into it. How do we ensure informed pi consent by users when they are not always informed that AI apps are in use by certain businesses? Interesting question. Who wants to respond to that one? 
anybody uh, cecilia thank I, you i can i can give it a try i mean the unintended use is exactly where it becomes extremely difficult right because if you do not mean to harm anyone and this actually happens well okay first of all it is unintended second of all i mean uh, the the informed consent that ai is, is used Right now, uh, I've seen this implemented. Most companies actually say I am a chat box uh, or I am a, a using uh, X, Y, Z. It depends again on the use case. It, and this is the difficult thing with AI. It's always the use. You can have an application which is fantastic for monitoring or searching for, you know, uh, cancer diseases to uh, or giving cures to specific diseases that can do something totally different, uh, harmful. But, you know, there will always be bad people trying to use good things for bad thing uh, for for bad doing bad things and 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 we should use our existing frameworks uh, legal frameworks to actually prevent that um but of course the the ability to see that ai is used towards consumers i think for the majority of companies this is already the case that they inform that that ai is used and again, if it is just a function that has absolutely no interest for the user, it's not that we go into the television and it explains exactly how the pixels are in, inside of your, your television, because it's not of interest, but we do know that it's a safe television and it's done according to the given standards. It is a very hard um, uh, question to answer, but I think we can trust that we have many mechanisms in place, but we also have you know, a legal system that will punish uh people who will do something intentionally but also uh judge when it is in an unintentional intentional da damage to uh, to uh, to other people okay and there's i think to finish off on the outside external questions a question directly addressed to to kim from frederick de Backer. he does regulation at telephonica on the prohibition on top of the risk pyramid applications would research also be prohibited or only use i hope that's a clear question Okay. Oh, that's that's very clear. I mean, I I, I owe to say that that we're still <laughs> it's still in the making, and as I said, it will will be adopted sort of most probably at the end of March. Um, but but basically, at the very top of the of the pyramid, I mean, things that are, are being uh, prohibited is basically AI practices that contradict EU values, and that is manipulative manu 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 yeah. or exploitative AI. It's addictive AI. It's uh, indiscriminate surveillance in public accessible spaces, general purpose social scoring, uh, for example, like the Chinese uh, score, uh, social scoring system, those kind of things would be outright uh, prohibited. Okay. I have a final question I'd like to, to address to Anna Michelle, but, uh, but maybe anybody else can come in afterwards. There's been a lot of, the, the, what's very interesting about this discussion is a huge amount of consensus about what, what the issues are, and it seems a, a very strong common view what what needs to be addressed in the future very little dissent or differences of opinion and maybe not always practical solutions because the comp issues are, are, are so complex and difficult certainly on a global scale never mind inside the european union but my question to anna michelle a lot of been references made in these kind of discussions about gdpr do you do you predict a kind of a kind of rerun in the european parliament with the with Kim's proposals, Madam Vestea's proposals uh, in the spring and the summer, as we had with GDPR. In other words, because you're on some, several key committees, uh, International Trade, Internal Market uh, Committee on Development, do you think that it'll be, uh, be quite a public the debate uh, taking place finally in, in, a, in a public arena, which is the European Parliament? Do you see that happening? Can you already predict that there'll be a, a very strong heated discussion about to take place inside the European Parliament on, on AI regulation, AI governance? I, I can already see a lot of appetite for what you're discussing. I, I really, I think that we're very likely going to have to go into the, in that direction. Um, so the, the short answer is yes. Okay. I, think that this, I, I think so, yes. I, I think it's inevitable. Look, and just to, to, to wrap up my thoughts on all this, I mean, yeah. really, um, you know, we're at the beginning really but we'll in 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 one in one sense we'll always be at the beginning because it's the nature of the beast it's, these technological developments are going to be rapid so if you're trying to actually regulate what's happening by the time you regulate it you're going to be on yesterday's page um, but at the same time um, it, it's it's always about the end and the end has to be human oversight and if the end is human oversight and accountability, then you'll always be able to navigate yourself through 
whatever the issues that come up. So I think I'll be optimistic and positive um, that it's great that we all agree on these basic principles because principles are not going to change. So whatever happens with the technology, if we're guided by these, then we'll figure it out. And if we need to, like I said, tweak the GDPR or tweak whatever framework comes out from the commission years from now, then we'll just do it. Thank, thank you, Michelle. We, we are more or less out of time, but anybody has a burning desire to make one last point that they have managed to insert into the conversation in the past 75 minutes, now is your opportunity. Uh, Jim, you, sir. Yeah, one, one last comment. I want to compliment my uh, co-panelists, not only on the the insights they, they shared today, which were really educational, but on the great work, you know, the commission, the parliament, the research institutions and industry has been doing on this issue. And, and it's because of that great work that Europe has actually posed to consider tangible legislation. Um, and, just, and just a cautionary note, the US is not this far along, right? And, and we have a number of policymakers who are keenly interested. We've had some recent developments that have been positive we have a, a new administration. We have a change in the composition of, of Congress, but um, you uh, need to be <laughs> insistent with us, but also patient with us because it will will take some time to get to get uh, close to where we're, we're able to um, uh, cooperate uh, uh, in a detailed way. Okay. Well, I'm going to draw this to a close. As you can see at the bottom, a little banner. There'll be a full recording of the session provided shortly. If anybody was not taking enough notes, I don't know about anybody else. I found this discussion absolutely fascinating. We covered so much ground in just an hour and a quarter. We have to leave it here. My thanks to the audience. My thanks to people who ask questions from the audience. Uh, but first, first and foremost, my thanks to this very, very interesting and, and an impressive panel. Thank you all very much for your time. You're all busy people, but thank you for making the time today. Uh, goodbye, everybody, and see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.